Um, I'm Guy Trigopinath. I'm the professor in the department. I'm a professor in the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. I'm also the director of the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality here at NYU. We're so delighted uh, to welcome you all to here today, and we want to begin by acknowledging that NYU is located on the unceded land of the Lenape peoples. We ask that you join, uh, join us in acknowledging the Lenape community, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. We would also like to recognize that New York City is currently home to approximately 100,000 people who identify as indigenous. We at CSGS affirm our commitment to working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler coloni colonialism in all contexts and to tracing the connections between settler colonial violence in the US and in other parts of the world. So this, as you may know, is actually the closing event of a semester-long collaboration that we at CSGS have been a part of, along with Red Canary Song and the a Asian Pacific American Institute here at NYU. So this collaboration has centered on the very beautiful art exhibition that you see next door. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet, please do so before you leave tonight. Um, and that exhibition is co-curated by Red Canary Song members Yin Q and Chang Gu. Um, the exhibition is actually being um, deinstalled next week, and so we will close tonight's panel with a performance and closing ritual by Red Canary Song to honor this moment and all the work and care that has gone into it. I'm very grateful to the APA Institute, um, the director, Crystal Parikh, and particularly Laura Chen Schultz and Amita Magnani for all their initiative and support in making this exhibition happen, and of course to Yin and Chong for curating the exhibition. RCS members have visited classes, they've given tours of the exhibition throughout the semester, um, and so I'm very grateful for all that they've brought to our NYU community. So we wanted to mark this moment by staging a conversation that places the work that RCS does here in New York City and transnationally in dialogue with activists and scholars working in different parts of the Global South, specifically the Caribbean, East, and Southeast Asia. I think we have a lot to learn from those cross-regional uh, and transnational collaborations and conversations on sexual labor, gender, migration, that places in the same frame these distinct locations that may initially appear to actually not have anything to do with each other, but I think you'll see in the conversations that happen the resonances between these contexts. Um, so I couldn't be more delighted to have this particular very illustrious constellation of pan panelists here. These scholars and activists are at the forefront of theorizing sex work outside of colonial narratives of rescue and rehabilitation, and they instead foreground the perspectives, expertise, and organizing efforts of workers themselves. So I'm gonna give you very brief intros of the panelists, um, and, and then I'll give you the, the rundown of, of the evening tonight. So we'll begin with Kamala Kempadu, who is Professor Emerita of Social Science at York University in Toronto, Canada. She's published many books and articles, many of which I've, I've taught, um, on the Caribbean, um, on C Caribbean sex trade and global anti-trafficking discourses. Most recently, she is co-editor with Elena Shi of White Supremacy, Racism, and the Coloniality of Anti-Trafficking. She's currently a visiting professor with the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies at Brown University. Next, we'll hear from Angelique Nixon, who is a Trinidad-based queer artist, scholar, and activist who works on social, climate, and gender justice, migration, and sexual rights. Angelique is the author of two books, the poetry collection, Saltwater Healing, and the monograph, Resisting Paradise, Tourism, Diaspora, and Sexuality in Caribbean Culture. She's currently a professor at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, and she's also the director there of the feminist LGBTQI civil society organization, CAISO, Sex and Gender Justice in Trinidad and Tobago. Next, we'll hear from Yin Q, who is a parent, writer, media pr producer, curator, and core organizer with Red Canary Song and the founding member of Kink Out. Yin's writings have been published in numerous journals and venues, and their media work includes Mercy Mistress, which is an autobiographical pilot based on their experience as a dominatrix, and Fly in Power, a documentary for Red Canary Song that we actually had the pleasure and honor of screening here at NYU um, just, just a few weeks ago. 
So Yin has brought sex worker art activations to the Leslie Lohman Museum, MoMA PS1, Performance Space New York, Brown University, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Los Angeles. And finally, we'll hear from Elena Shi, who is Professor of American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown University. She's the author of the monograph, Manufacturing Freedom, Sex Work, Anti-Trafficking Rehab, and the Racial Wages of Rescue, which I believe just came out this year, as well as the collection with Kamla Kempadu, White Supremacy, Racism, and the Coloniality of Anti-Trafficking. She's also a core collective member of Red Canary Song. So we're going to begin by having each of the presenters speak for no more than 10 minutes. Um, and that'll be followed by a moderated discussion and then questions from all of you. So do keep thinking about your, your questions as, as, um, as, as the presenters speak. And then we'll have the closing performance by Red Canary Song, which will take place not here, but in the gallery space. Right, Robert? Yes. It'll take place over there. So we'll sort of make our way over there. So I asked the panelists in their, in, in their opening remarks to reflect on the collaboration um, between them, because all of, the, all of these presenters have collaborated in one way or the other. And I wanted to hear from them about why those collaborations across geographies and national spaces matter. Um, I also would love to have them reflect on the main interventions that their scholarship and activism makes and the kinds of challenges they've faced in, in doing this work. Um, so without further ado, let's turn it over to Kamala Kempadu. It's really good to be here. Thank you so much, Gaitri, for inviting me to participate in this, this panel. Um, congratulations to the curators of the exhibition. That's, that's wonderful work. Mm -hmm. And wonderful to be here with all of you. This is a fabulous turnout this evening. Um, thank you all. Um, I didn't, know, didn't realize that I had to start this off. I've been <laughs> speaking on... Uh, topics around sex work, sexual labor, this global sex trade, and anti-trafficking for now going on 30-something uh, years. <laughs> uh, I've just retired, and <laughs> I'm hoping, I'm hoping, <laughs> I'm hoping that others are going to carry it on. I mean, I know others are carrying on the work and that I can step back. So I just want to take a few minutes to talk about um, some of the things that um, my work, I think, has uh, contributed to. Um, when I started um, the work and studies on uh, global sex work, sexual labor, and anti-trafficking, um, there were very few of us from the Global South doing that work, very, very few. And in fact, my research, I think, um, well, the main, one of the, the real issues that I, I took up from the beginning was the ways in which race and racism actually configured and played into uh, the sex trade. And that has been the focus of my work from day one. Um, but, you know, looking at women of color's sexual agency um, and how that works through in the sex trade. Um, and really, from the start, sort of contesting the dichotomy that had been set up through the... Um, the prostitutes rights movement at the time in the 1980s, uh, early 1990s, where um, there was a, this sort of dichotomy of, on the one hand, white women's sexual agency and freedom <coughs> and sexual rights, and the other side, the notion of trafficked women who happen to be women of color, migrant women, right? And so I sort of intervened, my work intervened in that dichotomy. Um, and so I started there, but then also progressed into looking at kind of the racialized and gendered harms caused by anti-trafficking, anti-trafficking programs and interventions. And that's the work I've been doing for the past 30-something years. Um, I started the work because I lived in the Netherlands. I was living in Amsterdam, studying, doing my research, uh, doing my master's and uh, starting my PhD there. But I lived also in the red light district in Amsterdam. And for those of you who've been to Amsterdam, know that that's a pretty substantial part of the city. Um, but the question about the position of women of color in, in the Amsterdam red light district was what I started with. 
Um, and, and there was very little research, very little knowledge. There was a little bit of activism at the time around it, but very, very, very little. And nothing that I could draw on to do, you know, to, to, to really say anything of substance about. Um, I, was, I was interested more generally about the questions of uh, women of color's labor in the uh, labor market more generally. Um, but um, the kind of questions I had about, you know, were women of color being trafficked, as we were talking about at the time, into the sex trade, troubled me or, you know, spurred me into thinking more. And I started tracing the women who lived, who came from the Latin American and Caribbean area into the Dutch um, sex trade and traced them back. Um, and that took me into the Caribbean, right? the Dutch Caribbean particularly. And it's there that I, um, that I spent some time thinking and, and, and researching um, the sex trade. Um, I really needed to know more about women of color's um, ideas about sex work. And the research I did, which was for my doctoral research at the time, um, produced more questions than answers. And I kind of thought, well, what I was finding in the Caribbean, in this one particular place, um, I wasn't sure whether I could generalize that, right? I was finding that, you know, um, as a sociologist, I really wanted to understand sort of the larger sociological patterns and interactions between the macro and the micro, and I know this all sounds a bit abstract and so forth. But because of that, I moved, for, my work moved from the Caribbean into the global south more generally. And I worked with Joe Dusma, sex worker at the time in Amsterdam, and we produced a book called Global Sex Workers, Rights, Resistance, and Redefinition, primarily about the understandings of sex workers, um, sex worker collectives and organizations about sexual labor in the global south. And that was the first kind of production from the global south that we uh, pulled together. And it was really um, important to do that cross, <laughs> cross continent, if you like, mm -hmm. but global south kind of um, examination. Um, and it was for me the way to kind of dig deeper into understanding things that I had found in the Caribbean to see whether they actually also made sense in other places as well. Um, and that followed by doing sort of regional Caribbean research and trying to produce ideas about what was going on in the Caribbean. And moving to Canada, I then extended my work into Canada as well, or worked in Canada. In Canada. Um, I focused, a lot of the focus of my work has been on, on the, um, of how sex workers articulate um, their ideas through not individual articulations or ideas, but as collectives through organizations. As I said, I'm a sociologist by training, and so that was a way of trying to understand um, definitions and, and um, under, um, collective agreements, if you like, about um, sexual labor sort of socially agreed upon definitions were important. So my work has been, through the years, um, really grounded in collaborations. And that's how it started in one thing once after, of course, the doctoral dissertation, which is this lonely exercise one does and goes through. Um, it, I, I built up my work through exchanges, through collaborations, through interactions, through working with sex worker rights organizations, with sex worker rights scholars, um, black feminists, feminists of color. And that has been really critical, I think, in what I've done over the years, um, to the point where it worked, well, put it this way, um, as an academic, I got pretty much slammed in the academy for doing that kind of work because I wasn't doing the 
monograph to get me through to tenure. I was doing, you know, the edited work, which meant working together with people, working with organizations, working with community groups and organizations. And that is not respected or really valued in the academy. Um, but, you know, I pressed on. I became a full professor, despite all that. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, it's tough, you know. It's tough to, to do that. But I'm very pleased to say that I was able to get through. And I've con I, I would like to think I've continued to use my academic position to further discussions and um, struggles of the sex worker rights movement globally, particularly for women of color, migrant um, sex workers of color. And I work today most closely with um, Butterfly, which is a sister organization of Can Red Canary Song in Toronto. Um, they would call on me, they call on me when they need um, a sort of voice to, to talk to and speak to politicians or, you know, local government people. Um, and, you know, I, I fulfill that role very, um, um, with, with um, pleasure, I should say. Um, it's my way of using my academic voice to translate into a public realm um, some ideas that may not be heard. Right. So um, I'll just kind of wrap up. I'll leave it there for now, and perhaps we'll take um, um, challenges. I suppose I could talk about some of the big challenges, the two big ones I think that I faced, that I still face, are the, the, the anti prostitution activists who um, support carceral solutions. Um, you know, and that is uh, just an ongoing fight that I think many of us have. Um, there's been a change, I think, in the kind of discourse that's come out from that, that, uh, that side, um, from an idea that all sex work is violence against women to a support of the kind of Nordic model, which criminalizes the clients and any third party who benefits from sex work labor. Um, and it's still a struggle. The Nordic model is being appropriated and taken over in all kinds of places, including by the Canadian government at the t time. And so it's an ongoing struggle for sex workers to kind of contest um, this model. And I'm with them there in that struggle. Um, the other big, big challenge that I think really affects the work around anti-trafficking is US imperialism. And this is evident through the way in which it wages the war on human trafficking globally through its annual um, Trafficking in Persons report. Um, the Trafficking in per the TIP report sort of corrals other countries into abiding by US standards and values and neoliberal castle um, politics. And I think it's a, it's a major issue and a major problem and one that we actually have to keep fighting against as well. But that one, I think, is bigger than just the war on trafficking. It's also happening in the war right now. Another kind of war which I think <coughs> is keeping us all on edge at the moment. But yeah, US imperialism to me is a real problem right now. <laughs> but anyhow, <laughs> I'll leave it here and turn it over to the others. Hi, everyone. Such a full room. It's really an honor and pleasure to be here and to be on this panel with all of you amazing, brilliant, beautiful people. Thank you so much, Gayatri, and thanks to all of the departments and the institutes that made this happen. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit. I'm gonna respond to some of the questions that Gayatri put forward. You can feel free to tell me to stop when you're ready. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about some of the specific issues that I raise in my work around sex, labor, and gender in the Caribbean. And in specific, uh, I've written a lot about sex work and trade and the sexual cultural availability of the region for tourism. So in my work, I've thought a lot about how our informal economies in the region are built through sexual labor. And it's something that we don't necessarily want to talk about because it would disrupt our lovely, beautiful notions of tourism, and it would disrupt people's you know, lovely vacations. And so it's something that is there. It's the underbelly of tourism. It's the hidden part of the economy that everyone is reliant on. 
Uh, I grew up in the Bahamas and in a tourism economy and my own mobility, my own social mobility, and the only reason I went to university was because I worked in the tourism economy starting at age 11, which is not a usual experience, but it's certainly an experience. So I'm really interested in my work and how there's so many challenges with how we think about or don't want to think about sexual labor that it then creates a problem for how we talk about sex work because we don't want to talk about it, it's there. Uh, much less the ways that people might be coerced into sex work or make choices and to engage in sex work because it's an economic benefit. And it's the part of that reality uh, in spite of dangers, in spite of the ways that sex work is criminalized across the, across the Caribbean region, people are engaged in different forms of sexual labor. So I was really interested in this in my work in Resisting Paradise. And I also uh, invited by Kamala to be a part of a special anti-trafficking issue uh, in the Social and Economic Studies Journal, it's a Caribbean regional journal, where we talked about the issues of anti-trafficking and the language of it. So I took up the question about this, these unspoken realities and how one of the contexts that I think is so important for the Caribbean in particular is that we, we are a unique region in that regard, like the Pacific. We have these overly dependent, tourism-dependent economies. and. It's then very difficult in terms of responding and having activism around these issues because this, there's not a lot of uh, political will to create any change. Another context I want to raise are, of course, building on the work of, of, of Kamala Kampadu's work, a number of us have engaged in the questions of how do we talk about these dominant discourses around human trafficking in the region. And Kamala's work has really helped us to understand the collateral damage of anti-trafficking uh, being sex workers, uh, labor migrants, and refugees. And in the region, I take up the issue that there's a lack of moral panic around human trafficking uh, because of tourism. And so I take this up in my work and I talk about the fact that, and, and extend the work that, uh, don't worry Kamala, we're taking up your work. We are. <laughs> uh, and we are, you are not alone anymore. Um, you know, a number of us have, have really taken the question, you know, uh, uh, Kambadu asks us in this amazing book called Sexing the Caribbean, how do we manage it? How do we transform our understandings of labor? How do we address those realities? Uh, and in my book, Resisting Paradise, I ask that very question. I say, what would happen if we framed sexual labor and transnational sex work as working outside of the bounds of capitalism because of the confines of neocolonialism? And what if we redefined the place and meaning of sex work in our languages and societies? So that's how I really see me taking up some of those questions and really extending and building because, because we have to. Uh, I wanna also talk a little bit about while we have this dependence on sexual labor, we have the criminalization of sex work. And so you have this double bind in the Caribbean where everyone knows it's happening. Uh, and so one of the things in terms of collaborations, uh, Kamala and I worked on an article together that's hopefully will be published soon. We'll just say yes. <laughs> and the title, <laughs> we'll say that. Uh, the title of that article, article is Caribbean Migration and Sexual Minorities Towards a Radical Sexual Praxis. And we, look at recent studies around the kind of anti-trafficking work and the, the problems of those TIF reports that frame the Caribbean region as overly, you know, as this nefarious place where all of this trafficking is happening and it increasing the border, border patrol and the de levels of deportation that people are experiencing without any looking at the North America or the pull of, of how migrants are being pulled into different kinds of work. And we focus specifically on sexual minorities, including LGBTQI plus people and sex workers, or people engaged in sex work. And we look at some of the concerns around the violence and unjust treatment of people, particularly on borders in intra-Caribbean travel, and how those same harmful narratives and the increased policing, how it actually doesn't end trafficking at all, we know that, it actually just continues to perpetuate the racialization uh, of workers themselves and also increases the levels of deportation. Mm -hmm. So in this piece, we wanted to think about how do we decolonize Caribbean sexualities and how do we think about the lives and practices of people who are commonly perceived as sexual outcasts in order to understand uh, and, and pose a different way to think about it and how do we, how do we 
how do we organize around some of those challenges? And in that work, uh, I was able to share some of the qualitative uh, work that I've done with civil society organizations, specifically uh, 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 collecting life stories uh, from a number of LGBTQI plus people living in Trinidad and Tobago, a number of whom were migrants. And so able to kind of highlight some of that work in this article and talk about the ways that survival sex and sex work become strategies for young people, young queer and trans people getting thrown out of homes or trying to find a better place and understanding that is a sexual economic transaction though informal, sometimes precarious, that it actually engages and offers safety, security, and shelter away from other kinds of abuse and a lack of acceptance. So I wanna just say a little bit more about, uh, also in, in terms of interventions in my work. So because of this and thinking about these tenuous uh, sexual relations, uh, I've proposed in my work, and also building upon <laughs> Kamala's work, that we need a framework for understanding uh, that is feminist, that is anti-racist, that's class-focused, and support women's migrant and sexual minority rights to mobility, security, and justice. And this framework is about how do we embrace and understand sexual labor and transactional sex work as an integral part of our informal economy. So that's what I call for in my work in different ways, and I feel like it really builds upon Kamala's work, and it's really building upon some of the, I think, very exciting Caribbean sexualities work uh, that we have to constantly do battle with this over, overtly and overt understanding of the Caribbean as overly homophobic and transphobic, and so kind of battling against that. And I guess I just want to wrap up by saying and talking a little bit about uh, the, the activism work that we do. Um, in, my, in my organization, Kaiso Sex and Gender Justice, what we've done, uh, because Trinidad and Tobago is a very interesting place where we have folks coming from around the region, some people seeking asylum, a lot of LGBTQI plus folks uh, from around the region, as well as folks uh, who are uh, from Trinidad and Tobago just dealing with a political and social landscape that can be very challenging for queer and trans people. And so what we've done is we've created a program to respond to violations and a part of that work uh, because of the need of, in particular, people engaged in sex work who need support, we've been able to create this community uh, of sharing, of skill sharing, of building, uh, of supporting communities with food, emergency, shelter, and all kinds of really <coughs> important, powerful things. And we have a program called Wholeness and Justice. And so we've been able to respond to some of those vulnerabilities. We've also been able to uh, do that in a way that is really, really sex positive, uh, that allows for conversations about sex, sexuality, and pleasure. So that's been at the forefront of the work, and we've created a lot of resources to do that. And because of the pandemic, we were able uh, to mobilize some funding and support for that. And then in closing, I want to say that, you know, we really have worked and are continuing to work around creating spaces of self advocacy. Uh, through online gatherings, through support groups, and through skill sharing, uh, because the community demands that. And so it's been a really exciting work. And uh, one of the things that it's leading us to into the next year, we have, where our future work, we're putting a public campaign together <coughs> around sex worker rights and a position paper on how we decriminalize sex work. So that's next year. So I wanted to end on a positive note because some of it, it's hard work, but to say that because of these connections and because of the ways that Kaiso in particular, we understand sex and gender justice to include anyone who's marginalized because of the kind, because of our sex, gender, identity, but also because of the kind of work we do, that's allowed us to have build a, a really strong community of folks who might not otherwise come together, but we do. Um, and that's a part of the work of what we call a sex positive, decolonial, and affirming bodily autonomy for people of diverse genders and sexualities. And so, um, hi, I am not a scholar. Um, <laughs> I've been a sex worker for over 30 years, so that's where I am. And also, I think like sitting in the seat, I also want to say that. Um, I share this seat with so many others in this room of Red Canary Song and beyond Red Canary Song. So many of the workers have showed up also um, and people from our community, our working community. So I just wanna give a huge 
bow of gratitude to those who have showed up for us. And, um, <laughs> and of course, this huge bow of gratitude also for those who are championing us into institutions because we are, we've you know, historically always been shut out or the shame and the stigma has kept us from having a seat at the table um, at many, many tables. So thank you to all um, and, and NYU for bringing us here. So as I said, I've been a sex worker for over 30 years. I started off as a full, fully nude dancer, lap dancer, and then moved into a kink worker. Um, so I haven't studied other areas except for New York City. So my expanse is actually my experience through time of seeing how um, working communities have come together, how we've organized. And when you bring up the words messy, it is very messy because I want to remind everyone that many of us, inc myself included, who come to this work um, have gone through not only personal trauma, but also on a daily basis, systemic tra trauma. Um, having been arrested, um, going through uh, sexual harassment, sexual um, violations from, from policing, um, to a whole wide range, right? So, and, and the amount of shame that is kind of around us on a constant basis. So, what I have seen through time of, of my experience is um, that we were first getting together and making zines, right? It was a very punk rock scene of like, really just sharing, z writing zines on the most practical ideas of like know your rights um, idea, um, information, but also like how to tell whether you have cuts in your hands. You squeeze lemon juice on them to see if you have cut cuts in your hands. If you have cuts in your hands, make sure you're wearing gloves that day if you touch a client. Mm -hmm. Those kind, that kind of information that keeps each other, one, <coughs> you know, ourselves safe. Um, so everything from that to, um, you know, hosting smaller gatherings of Know Your Rights, finding lawyers who would walk, work with us to really let us know what were the gray areas, how are we supposed to advertise. Um, there was this big myth for a very long time that you shouldn't advertise with a strap on um, because it indicates penetrative sex and that for some reason dominatrixes were in the gray zone so we were kept safe, but that was absolutely not true. Um, 2007 showed a huge ra um, rash of raids all throughout New York City where um, my friends were getting um, arrested all the time and there was fear, there was a constant um, daily fear I was walking around the city um, really looking behind my back thinking that there was um, that there were police cars you know following me uh, we had I had um, also organized a, a really large know your rights seminar that um, to combat that and was told that there were like police sting operations people with microphones in the room um, posing as workers so there is this constant fear in organizing itself um, so that's the biggest challenge um, but as the years have grown on also. I have seen how uh, workers have really stepped up to support one another, which wasn't always true. There was always this, there, there had been a sense of, um, because of the fear, this division and constant division. I'm not saying that that doesn't happen now, um, but the idea is that we can come together and know that we're messy and that, that we can hold each other in space um, in these spaces is really important. I feel like that's starting to become more and more um, the accepted way of organizing. So I'm sitting here more as a platform <laughs> in that I, my, my passion is to get, create spaces, create plat platforms for workers to be felt to be seen, to be heard, because most of the workers um, cannot do so for themselves. So you've noticed from in the gallery space that we keep the faces of Red Canary Song members out of the, out of the of, of any photos, um, uh, and that is for the reasons of really protecting each other um, from harassment, from stalking, from from being policed. Uh, so my my. What I feel is my duty is to is to be able to create the platforms for these the workers to have a voice um, to combat what I think is one of the the you know the biggest problems, which is the shame. 
Um, we can talk about policing and decriminalization, but for me, I also have seen how shame whittles down um, each other and ourselves, um, especially through isolation and workers who work alone, uh, and having lost so many people to um, mental health problems, um, to suicide, to drug overdoses. Those are things that like, I'm really interested um, about um, really combating. Okay, sorry. <laughs> to speak louder. So as I said, I'm, I'm here as a platform. So I'm going to read actually some quotes from some of the other RCS members. Um, and this is from one of our Chinese outreach workers, uh, members. My name is Lisa Zhang. Being an immigrant far from home has been hard. I experienced my mother's death during the COVID-19 epidemic. and My father was seriously ill, paralyzed and in bed for more than two years. Because I did not have a green card, I could not go home to visit my parents. So I had to be strong and earn more money to help my father and avoid suffering from illness. I must be strong because I am the eldest in the family and have to support my younger siblings. I started working as an outreach member at RCS in June 2022. I have experienced an extraordinary time with organization. The other members have given me strength and courage. Because I have been in the massage business, I know a lot of sisters who work in massage. Now I help many sisters talk to each other and make their lives better. Talking to one another in a way that points to assistance and understanding has been important. And from another member, Charlotte, whose incredible food is in the back. Please partake. We are all workers, sex workers, massage workers, gender workers. Now we are in a place where we are not even treated as human beings. There are many people who endure day after day in a dark and cramped place. They live their whole lives without peace of mind. They are chased by crackdowns, and in the process they die, get injured, or sometimes become disabled so they live with scars that cannot be erased for the rest of their lives. And they live with shame as invisible fingers are pointed at them. I don't know why the stigma exists. What we do is to help people feel at ease in their bodies and minds. Our guests come to us for comfort to share their severe mental stress, fatigue, loneliness, sadness, and joy. Dear friends, please help us raise our voices. Please help us live safely. Thank you, Yan, for um, really centering the voices of our uh, massage worker outreach team um, who are here in this room today. Uh, it is like the lesson that you all teach us um, that inspire us to come together. Uh, thank you so much to the team here at NYU, to Gayatri, Robert, and Anita for all of your work, for your vision, for your trust um, of us. I'm going to share maybe a little bit longer because I want to tie us back and take us very, very far and then bring us back to where we sit today. So in June 2016, the Natri Massage Business, located in a prominent Bangkok red light district, was raided by the Royal Thai Police after an alleged three-month sting operation where Thai police visited the massage business sometimes and often undercover, sometimes engaging in entrapment in order to prove that illegal acts of sex were happening on site. The Nattery raid was justified by Thai law enforcement under suspicion that underage workers were working, were present. And this was necessary to justify their policing because under a rabid global anti-trafficking regime, or what my co-panelist Kamala Kempitu has referred to as the war on trafficking, um, nation states around the world face considerable pressure to identify victims of trafficking. So this is a sensationalist panic that traces back to the year 2000 with the passing of the United Nations Palermo Protocol and the simultaneous United States Trafficking Victims Protection Act to watershed pieces of legislation that promised to consolidate pre-existing laws around sex, labor, gender into one streamlined framework. And in the past two plus decades since their passing, critical commentators have noted that 
all of these measures only serve to criminalize migration, to um, turn to carceral forms of feminism, <laughs> are fundamentally rooted in different forms of racism and coloniality akin to anti-blackness when they are manifested in a false analogy that human trafficking is akin to quote unquote modern day slavery. But most importantly, a counterpart to policing is what the late great sex worker activist Carol Lee has called Woo! the anti-trafficking industrial complex, amassing billions of dollars in profits for the actors who design and consume them. Thai sex workers provocatively pointed out that the naturally raid happened in June. Why, they asked? Because it is in June of every year that the U.S. State Department's Trafficking in Persons report is released, a global ranking mechanism that allocates and ranks, that anoints, you know, Americans working in U.S. embassies around the world, anoints them to rank countries around the world into a four-tier ranking system based on a set of U.S. minimum standards on their compliance with anti-trafficking efforts. In total that day, 121 workers were arrested in the massage parlor. Um, 121 of them were Thai nationals over the age of 18. They were systematically fined 3,000 baht, the equivalent of 100 US dollars, and then released to deal with the aftermath of a traumatic arrest. 21 workers were undocumented migrants, mainly from Myanmar, and they were placed into a separate government detention center to proceed with their deportation. 15 workers were under the age of 18 and were immediately classified as victims of human trafficking, placed into NGO and government shelters. And though they represented just a minority of the arrests made that day, the raid was considered successful by anti-trafficking standards. And this was precisely because the Thai government could use it in its annual report to serve the TIP ranking. The month of the Naturi Raid, I happened to be living in Chiang Mai, about a 12-hour train ride north of Bangkok, running English and Chinese conversation classes with sex workers at Empower Foundation's office in northern Thailand. Empower is Thailand's oldest sex worker rights organization, founded in 1985, and runs the world's first sex worker-owned cooperative bar called the Can Do Bar. At the bar, I witnessed organizers wrangle cell phones ringing off the hook as family members of those who had been detained in the Naturi raid sought to found information about their loved ones. Empower sex workers devote an enormous amount of time, resources, and their creativity uncovering the human rights violations endured at the heart of anti-trafficking. For instance, Empower's Last Rescue of Siam is a black and white parody film that documents a commonly failed rescue attempt amongst the numerous follies that they are somehow able to make comedic in their satirical film, which happens to be subtitled in three different languages. They document how, in order to prove that Thai police have arrested people under the age of 18, they have subjected them to things like bone density scans, which is why you see not only the war room here, but also the corresponding dentist's office, using the bone density metrics of grown British adults to measure Thai women to then determine that they are under the age of 18. And this is used in the case of workers who are arrested without um, identity cards and, and you know, turning to bone density in order to prove their victimization by, by virtue of their age. Empower's hit and run report shown here, an entirely sex worker conceived, led, researched, analyzed, written and disseminated research report details that workers detained in anti-trafficking reigns are often detained indefinitely and systematically stripped of their cash and phones once they enter trafficking detention facilities for fears, shelters say, that traffickers could use them to further coerce and manipulate them. However, this also means that it's impossible for those detained to connect with family members and community outside. The concern for the treatment and human rights of those detained reached a fever pitch when Thailand's National Human Rights Commissioner joined the cause and publicly denounced the Anatri Raid, noting that, quote, detention is a violation of the human rights of women. 
But the Naturi scandal tells us something very important about global anti-trafficking efforts, despite all of the concerted a, a position of sex worker rights organizations working on the ground, who continually assert and show us that anti-trafficking is used to police sex workers and that policing is certainly not the path towards justice, mainstream anti-trafficking arc is always more appealing. So news media like that scene here, the Bangkok Post, reveled in another successful rescue of victims of trafficking with popular headlines that heralded the sting at Natri Massage. Most notably in this arrest, the only non-law enforcement actor allowed to participate at the raid was a Bangkok Post photographer who was invited to document photos of the raid and snap dozens of photos of workers' faces without their consent. These alluring images seen here aim to illustrate to the public the despair that workers must face and how these dramatic moments of rescue are perched as important turning points in workers' lives. I recently finished a book that takes these promises of rescue and rehabilitation at its point of analytic departure, asking how rescue and rehabilitation appropriate low-wage women's work at the dispersive and labor process levels. For over a decade, I have traced a very peculiar emergent commodity of what the anti-trafficking movement calls the slave free good. As an ethnographer, I looked particularly at the very special commodity of jewelry made by sex workers, by former sex workers, by allegedly rescued sex workers between, between their sites of consumption in the United States and their sites of production in China and Thailand. Through my research, I sold this jewelry with anti-trafficking activists in the United States. I talked with people who bought this jewelry. But most importantly, I made jewelry alongside so-called rescue Thai and Chinese sex workers. And my work exposes the large yet invisible gap between these fantasies of ethical consumption and virtuous labor. So rescued sex workers were paid at the minimum wage, which is a third to a fifth of what they formerly earned as sex workers, and encountered numerous forms of moral and social control that attempted to rehabilitate them from the imagined harm and trauma endured at the hands of sex work. One worker shared with me that she was surprised that when she started working at these anti-trafficking social enterprises, that she, would be, that she had to sign a contract agreeing that she would no longer sell sex, nor would she patronize any of the bars where she used to work. And during my residence in Bangkok, this behavioral contract was patrolled by mandatorily requiring workers to submit their Facebook passwords so that activists could map monitor their sexual activity online. The pathway to freedom for quote unquote rescued sex workers was paved by the promises of global capitalism through the discipline of a racialized and redemptive low wage labor. And note, these rehabilitative projects are fundamentally confusing to these workers because they argue that, you know, they've learned, they've known how to sew um, since, since, since like, <laughs> since like elementary school and that working 18 hour shifts where they had to wear diapers because they weren't allowed um, bathroom breaks on the H&M factory line were the exact kinds of manufacturing forms of coercion that led them to find sex work in the first place. But it is often these exact forms of labor organizing at the workplace level that all of these interventions displace. <laughs> the work of jewelry making as an anti-trafficking enterprise is unique because it spans borders and engages activists, consumers, and producers in the growing and incredibly alluring fight to combat trafficking. But because the jewelry is made with an international and specifically American clientele in mind, all of the promotional materials like you see here are in English. Mm -hmm. This means that while jewelry producers finger through pamphlets on a daily basis, attaching earrings to promotional cardboard or stuffing jewelry into bags that tell you, quote, about this purchase, jewelry makers in both of these cities didn't really necessarily know the meaning of the, jewel, the, the content of the promotional materials they were touching, though all could see very clearly the price that the jewelry was being sold for. In Thailand, workers were incensed when I translated promotional materials that suggested that Buddhism was the reason why rural 
Thai families, quote unquote, sold their daughters into the sex trade. Right. What is the reason we have such a large commercial sex industry in Thailand, they asked me? It's because of the Americans. <laughs> All were aware of the strategic foreign policies set in place by then Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara that designated Thailand as a site of military rest and recreation during the Vietnam War. So viewed as a legacy of US militarism as opposed to backwards religious or cultural norms would shift the way that we approach interventions into sex work. But rather than find ways to repair these brutal legacies of US militarism in Southeast Asia, anti-trafficking groups actually endorse new forms of military and military rescue. And I want to conclude with one final connective thread that brings us back to the Natri raid at the outset of the talk. We're Just a few done. months yeah. before the Natri raid, conservative political commentator Glenn Beck took a trip to Thailand with American anti-trafficking rescue operation Unground Railroad. <sighs> and its founder, Tim Ballard. And for those who might find Tim Ballard's name familiar, his work entered the mainstream Hollywood landscape this past summer when a biopic glorifying his work named The Sound of Freedom became a box office hit totaling $140 million of ticket sales in its opening, opening weekend, July 4th. The Sound of Freedom details Ballard's work as an anti-trafficking crusader becoming famous after absconding his job in US Homeland Security and as a former Navy SEAL to found an organization dedicated to rescuing child victims of self -tra sex trafficking. Ballard is an interesting character to understand the world of power, influence, and profit in anti-trafficking work. He built Operation Underground Railroad seemingly out of thin air in 2013, yet rose to such influence and expertise that by 2017, he was invited by then President Trump to sit in the White House's anti-trafficking task force. And by 2023, had amassed a fifth, well, this, is, this is 2022, but by 2023, had amassed a $53 million annual budget. OUR has attracted the most diverse and peculiar followers, including members of the Mormon Church and the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Raving about this trip on his talk show, Beck professed an admiration for the organization's work, specifically praising the relationship that OUR had developed with Thailand's Department of Special Investigations, often described to American audiences simply as Thailand's FBI. Beck rejoiced over des describing the privilege of having the honor to meet the head of Thailand's FBI. Why might you ask, does the Thai FBI want to sit down with Glenn Beck? <laughs> In short, the organization promises to donate paramilitary manpower through foreign police, through its cadre of former cops, ex-military that formed their, their volunteer base. Secondly, they use some of their multi-million dollar funding to donate US military and defense surveillance technologies to Thai law enforcement to aid their policing of trafficking. And it was in exactly this kind of foreign military expertise and intervention that underwrote the Natri massage raid, subjecting Asian sex workers to brutal policing and only offering them redemption if they agreed to participate in vocational training schemes that relegated them to low-wage manual labor with the promises of freedom tied only to the most coercive forms of Western femininity. I bring the example of the Natri Raid into the space today because these moral panics circulate back to the United States through the policing of sex workers and migrant workers and my massage workers in the United States. And because we're celebrating the closing of this phenomenal exhibition, um, I think that it's important to note the similarity that we see here. Um, in a closing shout out to the work of our outreach team, it was through our outreach that we learned about the disproportionate policing of Asian massage worker groups across North America, not only for charges of prostitution, but for charges of um, unlicensed massage. We call on you today to support a legislative effort to decriminalize unlicensed massage in the state of New York, which would be the first um, effort to decriminalize unlicensed massage um, in the nation. But um, we know that our liberation is tied into uh, other adjacent struggles. And last night, 
our Chinese outreach team actually paused our outreach in, in um, Jackson Heights and Corona to support Queens Neighborhood United and Centro Corona who are here today to amplify voices against the ongoing casino stadium megaplex that is completely already, even though not even begun, has uh, endorsed new kinds of um, per policing surveillance in the so-called cleanup um, in these streets. We remain committed to amplifying the Ain't I a Woman campaign uh, which demands an end to the 24-hour working day. And finally, we understand that none of this can happen without mobilizing to end settler colonial occupation and genocide currently taking place in Palestine. Thank you. Thank you all for an incredible set of uh, presentations and you know, giving us a sense of each of the contexts that you're working with. Um, I mean, I think you know, Elena brought us very clearly back to the point that Kamala started us off with, which is the, the issue around US imperialism, right? So the way it plays out both in the Caribbean and in Southeast Asia as sort of giving us the, the basis of um, the, 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 this kind of anti-trafficking discourse that we see. And so I guess my question to all of you is, you know, th these are such, these are, you know, historical legacies, global phenomenon that have these very um, granular effects in the lives of the folks that you work with. Um, so how do you, how do you sort of work on these different scales, I guess is my question. How do you sort of, you know, how do you recognize that this is sort of, you know, the legacies of U.S. imperialism, U.S. militarism, Southeast Asia and the Caribbean are the, are the basis for the, for the problems. Um, as they play out in these very specific ways, but how do you, how do you, <laughs> how do you deal with that? Like, what, what, what kinds of strategies do you use to combat that? And I'll say that RCS, I think, is quite remarkable and constantly making those connections very apparent. So, I don't know, um, Yin, Elena, do you want to start with some of your thoughts around how RCS sort of works on these different s scales? Has that analysis always in play in some ways? Uh, some uh, a, a very trenchant, um, not necessarily divide, not a conflictual divide, but a trenchant separation that we recognize within our organizing um, might be neatly classified into that of um, community organizing and worker base building, and then that of advocacy and more like arts-based activations and amplifying different platforms. And in many ways, the work that they, the way that they work together is seen in this like incredibly beautiful, um, like cura curated and presented installation in the way that uh, Yin and Chong and, and other artists as a part of RCS always do is that you, we integrate the lessons of outreach into these kinds of art activations, but also as its core, the ways that artists, sex workers, programs with more platforms, more access to different kinds of capital, were able to underwrite and fund RCS early on, were also the ways that we were able to, in our own way, escape these you know, criticisms of the nonprofit industrial complex and not turn to traditional top-down sources of funding that had so problematized anti-trafficking. So I think there's a beautiful circularity and alternative economy within the work that we do. But I think without or over glorifying it, it means that there are oftentimes divides across these different levels, across different levels of who speaks what language. A dream that um, Yan Hu, who spoke yesterday at the beautiful QNU activation that is here somewhere in the back. Um, one of Yan Hu's dreams as a lead outreach organizer is that we can eventually move our outreach to just two languages to finding workers who could speak between Chinese and Korean to eliminate English completely. And language is important um, to center on because it's the thing that, you know, that brings our speakers together today, that unifies us, that makes these different things legible to different publics. But that is a level of like, how do we do outreach in these languages that are not, um, you know, languages of migrants is really, really important. But then how do we work to transmit and um, translate those is the work that I think um, the artists within RCS have really thought really carefully 
Yeah. I also want to say that um, working, I think that when I was first doing organizing as a sex worker, um, I wasn't looking at the global scope, right? Um, I was working within communities where we were facing police, so it wasn't something that we were thinking on a, on a global scope, and that's something that I've been learning through um, the, the scholars who are present. And, and um, But when you're facing crisis on a daily basis, as are many of our outreach workers are, are working with people who are fi facing crisis, um, those, you know, many people in the community don't have the scope or the, the um, privilege of being able to take the step, step back to look at the larger um, pictures. Um, but when we're able to like work in the, these um, fractals and come together and always making sure that we center those who are the most vulnerable and with the least privilege, then that's how we're able to um, constantly, yeah, bring bring the larger scope in and, and um, be able to speak on different many different levels, whether it's through art activation so that way people can come together through celebration or whether it's outreach members um, inviting other workers to dim sum and um, you know having these slow grow conversations. So one of the challenges um, that always comes up with this organizing too is how to find the people who are going to do the work of the of the of the edu of educating people right through in community um, because the time um, is so precious um, for for workers to be able to step away from their daily work of getting food on the table or sending p uh, money back home like how can they actually um, take a day off to do organizing work uh, and actually finding the people who actually want to do that work. That's been the, the most challenge as well. So it really came through RCS being able to fundraise. And I think that that was where I stepped in of like uh, into Red Canary Song was looking at like, how do I rob and hoe the money of, to get it to the workers so that they can do mm -hmm. the work that I cannot do because I cannot speak, <laughs> speak Mandarin enough. And also I don't come from the community. And so we needed the people who were like the most trusted um, who are coming from massage worker community to be able to speak to their fellow sisters and aunties. Mm -hmm. um, and then I found myself just constantly being pulled in by these brilliant minds and by just like the heart and soul of the people involved mm -hmm. in RCS. Yeah, thank you. I'll just pick up on something that um, um, you just raised, um, that um, education is where my <coughs> intervene as well and keep, keep building that. And keep building the critique, I think. Um, and as you know, an academic myself, that's where my work is. Mm -hmm. And I was really pleased to be able to speak to Elena's class yesterday. She's teaching a class at Brown on critical thinking on anti-trafficking. Mm -hmm. That didn't exist in my day when I was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's really, I mean, you know, important that this work has been grown. The critique on about um, anti-trafficking and the connection to U.S. imperialism, you know, is there and it's growing. And I think, um, you know, to, for those of us who have that platform to use it to listen to the critique that's coming out from the organisations, and to amplify that through the academy is really important as well. So education is really an important one, and you know, to keep publishing, writing, to just keep that critique on, keep going. It's hard work. <laughs> but yeah, it has to be done. Yeah, I just want to echo the same. I mean, I think for in the Caribbean, we're in a un in a troubling uh, situation where governments are really pressured by the the whole U.S. imperialist. Uh, I mean, everything from how the U.S. bullies uh, the Caribbean around the that that uh, trafficking in persons report. It becomes a bullying mechanism. So you're not going to get aid and money. We're we're not going to sign that deal if you don't agree to quote unquote arrest this many people for trafficking or catch the traffickers. Meanwhile, we know that it's not, it's just migrant sex workers, mostly women who end up and increasingly trans people who are being deported. And so it's so difficult to say, how do you deal with it? Because the governments are making these decisions, they're pressured. Uh, so in Trinidad and Tobago, we're in a unique position where because of the Venezuelan crisis, we have a lot of Venezuelan migrants and so we're dealing with the very real issue 
of an over-sexualization of specific groups of migrants, a long history of colorism, uh, and then the xenophobia that's, that's sort of being triply put onto specific communities. And so there's the real issue of Venezuelans being exploited that I think for, for those of us working in human rights, we have to address. And at the same time, call for decrim. So, and, and, and so it's sometimes it's just you have to be strategic depending on who you're speaking with and who you're organizing with. So one of the things that we've been really, we, we work really hard to support sex workers. What, what do you need? That's the kind of, that's frontline provision stuff, right? And that may be very different than how we engage with governments mm -hmm. uh, to tr try to get social services. Because that whole rescue, that rescue stuff is also there. It's like, what are you going to do to, re and we're like, we just want to make sure that people are safe and folks have more choices. So really, I think one of the challenges that I think we constantly face is the realities of deportation that's happening, that we know that, that, that migrants are experiencing, uh, and the folks who are the folks who are trying to just make a living, like it, it's messy. I didn't go into any of the messiness. When you said I was like, yeah. So talking about the messiness, because when you have limited economic choices, you could get deported at any moment. You're in a community where folks are really battling against limited resources. It can get very challenging. Mm -hmm. um, so one of, I, I just wanna share one, uh, one example of how we've been able, uh, one of the things that we're trying to put together and get some funds, we have a, pro a project that we're calling Sex Positive Towards, a sexu towards Sexual Healing and Justice, uh, where we want to do uh, workshops for sex workers in specific areas of Port of Spain and Trinidad, uh, and at the same time also have support groups. So we put this lovely proposal together one of the embassies, I won't say which one, uh, said, oh, we have money, you know, give us the proposal. That's sometimes how funding works, right? Well, like, so we put this lovely proposal together. We had a whole year of campaigns, protect sex worker rights, raising awareness. We had a podcast, you know, we put all this great stuff together. And then the embassy was like, wait, you're going to talk about sex worker rights? No, we can't. And it's going to be in the public. And they were like, no, we can't do that. So we were like, okay, we're gonna take our proposal and we're gonna put, give it to another funder, fine. And so we said, no. I mean, one of the things that we've consistently done because of US money was tied up with, if you did any work around abortion or sex worker rights, they would say, no, there was like a whole gag rule. So we said no to money. We said no to money for a long time. And I think that's the part of the, that very difficult uh, process that you have to make decisions as a civil society organization, but and then some people end up doing it And I'm not knocking them like if you you have to get your hustle on but I do think it makes for challenging organizing and You have to listen <laughs> you have to listen you have to be strategic and what we've tried to do We're not a solely sex worker organization But it just happens to be that we've created these collaborations and it, part of it is because uh, one of the organizations that was really leading this work, uh, um, one of the ba main activists, she passed away during the pandemic, and there was a huge uh, hole in that process. And so it's Trans Coalition, Transgender Coalition of Trinidad and Tobago, and CAISO, we got together to create this homeless injustice with other LGBT organizations because we saw that it needed to happen. And so sometimes I think those things happen, so we don't have one sex worker organization uh, although there are others across the Caribbean, and that, you know, that collective has, well, there's been, it's, there's grown, it's grown, there's had, there's been some dips, but I do think uh, that the more that we see LGBTQI rights, sexual rights, and sex worker rights as aligned, I think that's one of the things we have to, we have to say that we are together and we're demanding sexual rights or freedom for all of us. We can't be on this whole weird, some of the, the carceral feminism, but also the feminists who, are not interested in actually talking about sex work. And, and that, that's also a reality that we have to constantly, I think, battle and push against. And we have to be defiant, I think, in that process. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. So we have um, just a few minutes for questions, so please. Yeah, I just wanna thank you so much for everybody. I spent some time in Southeast Asia recently, and in Indonesia specifically, and I wanted to ask all of the panelists how do you respond to more grassroots, um, you know, community efforts to push back against these kinds of endeavors, feminist endeavors? Because my experience in Southeast Asia 
was not political. It was very much from like women in the community pushing back against all of these endeavors. And with very real concerns, with very real concerns from the community. And I just wanted to, to, to ask, like, how, what, what is the communication that happens when people push back within the community? Against things like feminism, against things like sex worker rights, against, you know, against these kind of like large scale political concepts so, that are unfamiliar to the community. So you mean sort of like conservative respectability politics? Yes. I mean, yes. we're very familiar with that, I yes. think. Yes. Um, especially in the Caribbean, there's so much, well, across, you know, we, we're dealing with colonial religious conservative values and this upholding of respectability politics. Yes. Again, it's a part of the pushing back. You know, one of the things that I think we've done, well, maybe fairly well, a part of it is that, that kind of raising consciousness about, okay, well, where do these ideas come from? And, and whose interests are we upholding by being so respectable? Like that's a colonial construction. And I think, but that's worked in some of the conversations where we say, this is, this is uh, not us. This is not of our uh, ancestral heritage. It's not who we are. And it's not a part of our resistance to those colonial constructions. And in fact, we're just kind of feeding more into it. So I think a part of it is that process of, you know, make, making that uh, contradiction clear. Uh, I don't think it's an easy, it's not easy, but I think, um, I think that's, that's where you start. You start with saying, but what do respectability politics get us? Where does it get us? Uh, and the other part of it, I think, for me and my work, I've really, I've really tried to be honest about the sexual labor in all of our lives. So in my work, I end up talking about tourism as anyone who works in the tourism industry in the Caribbean, in some way you're selling yourself, you're selling sex, you're selling your body. I thought about my, I worked in bars for many years and then I ended up writing about my mother who worked in a cabaret and in a hotel and she was a topless dancer. And I never thought about her as being uh, you know, a sex worker, but she was in many ways. That's, she did that for many years and how people responded to her and talked about her brought me a lot of shame growing up. And I, I didn't even realize that until I was an adult. It took me a long time to figure that out. And so in my work, I also talk about the, all of the ways that we are caught up in these entanglements, that this idea of, oh, you have to be married and you have to have this particular kind of life. That's a colonial white middle classness that's put on to us. And when we dig deep into our families, we realize that's not actually the reality at all. That's not how we've lived. And, and our, our entanglements are so much more complicated. So I try to go to that angle when I'm doing organizing. If you have someone who's really resistant, like, oh no, I'm against that, I don't believe in it. So how do you figure out a way to have an open conversation? Because I think all of our families and lives are so much more complicated than sometimes we're willing to admit. I also just want to say that that's not just in other countries. I mean, in New York City, um, <laughs> it took a long time for many dominatrixes also to recognize themselves as sex workers. So I would have conversations with many of my own peer, and when I talked about sex worker rights, they were like, wait, wait, wait no, I don't do sex work, I'm a dom. And I'm <laughs> <laughs> And yet there would be, you know, there was plenty of sex work happening. Um, and so, for example, so one of the people I knew, too, who really was adamant about not being a sex worker, though, later on, then faced themselves, you know, was facing um, having their children being taken away for being a sex worker. And I, I was able to provide them a lawyer to, to, to fight for them. And they, she finally... Um, conceded that like, oh wow, this is something that like, right. thank God you've been doing sex worker rights for so long because, you know, she was ignoring it and she was, she was brushing it off as if we weren't all in the same boat. So it's just, it, you know, I think it's just a really slow movement. And in terms of pushing against an entire movement, I don't know that we already have to worry about the, the uh, anti-traffickers, so from within community, I feel it's just really just about constantly inviting people in to have that conversation and not necessarily shaming them for coming to have the conservative views because we all grew up with, many of us grew up with that as well, with a don't ask, don't tell, silence in the families, um, you know, so. 
uh, it brought to mind two things. The first, that there's so many forms of everyday resistance that I encountered in my research that aren't supposed to show up in books, that aren't supposed to show up in platforms like this, because to amplify them in some ways enables other people to repress them, those minute daily forms of resistance in the interpersonal. And I think that then, like on an analytic level, it means that we have to open up space not only for these overt instances of protest and action, but when how silence can be um, absolutely transformative. And then I work when I see when when rehabilitated workers quit rehab. That's absolutely something that needs to be noted. But like things like quitting and those kinds of sciences are absolutely erased from the record. And then very finally, empower has a board game called Seven Hours, 55 Minutes that tries to break down what a sex worker in Thailand might do within like an eight hour industrialized working day. And it is supposed to put sex work along other kinds of maybe industrialized recognized labor, but also to draw connectivity between sex, sex work and intimate labor, mm -hmm. sex work and marriage, which is they claim sex work unpaid. Um, and I think trying all those um, links is really, really important.
나이가 안드나 보다 요즘 부쩍 나물이 먹고 싶다 나이가 드나 보다 흰머리가 당연하게 느껴진다 나이가 드나 보다 자꾸 마음이 허전해진다 나이가 드나 보다 자꾸만 밝은 색이 좋아진다 나이가 드나 보다 빨간 립스틱이 바르고 싶어진다 나이가 드나 보다 눈만 한번 다 넘어간다 나이가 드나 보다 옛 생각이 많이 난다 나이가 드나 보다 가족들이 그리워진다 나이가 드나 보다 자꾸 지친다 自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自由，自